Uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis is a really important disease because some of these patients have systemic involvement, depends on the setting. Um, it's often in infants, rarely though can happen in adults. And uh, the different forms of it, of course, which we all learn in med school, but oftentimes when we see it in the setting of dermatology and derm path, it's in babies that have multiple reddish brown papules that are either on the scalp or in the groin, particularly like in the, the inguinal crease, right? And that's kind of how one of the tricks to tell it apart from, you know, diaper dermatitis, right? Is that it's not in the central area, it's actually out at the crease on the edge. And then sometimes people have bone involvement, lung involvement, or other systemic involvement. And it can be a very serious disease depending on the extent of involvement, okay? The thing to remember about Langerhans histiocytosis is you have histiocytes, um, the Langerhans cells, which are basically like a variation of, I guess, or a relative of histiocytes. Maybe I should have reworded that, but they look histiocytoid. They fill the papillary dermis like we saw in a couple of the diseases earlier, but also they infiltrate the epidermis. And remember, where do Langerhans cells live? They live normally in the mid layer of the spinous layer of the epidermis, right? They're, they're as kind of sentinels scouting for antigens that are breaking through the skin, and then they eat that up and process it and take it back to a lymph node and activate an immune response. That's that's my that's the level of immunology I know. Very simple bedtime story immunology, okay? Um, not real deep science immunology. But the, because of that, whatever marker it is, whatever surface molecule these cells have that allow them to cross the basement membrane and get into the epidermis, they have that in normal Langerhans cells. So of course, Langerhans histiocytosis in the, the proliferative form of Langerhans cells, they also have the ability to get into the epidermis and they often do. So you don't wanna confuse this with the pagetoid spread of melanoma. You don't wanna confuse this with epidermotropism in mycosis fungoides. I certainly have seen times where a case of Langerhans cell made me think of those things. Um, and also, guess what? They're S100 positive. So you could, if you made a mistake and you did S100 and thought, oh, it's S100 positive, could be melanocytes. I mean, usually you wouldn't make that mistake, but do keep in mind that occasionally it could get confused. So the infiltration of the epidermis is usually present. I've seen times that Langerhans cell histiocytosis did not have that, but it's usually there. Okay. And the, the two things, Doug Parker, my fellowship director, liked to talk about there are two main diseases that fill the papillary dermis with cells, and that's Langerhans cell and mastocytosis. And the difference he said is that mastocytosis respect the boundary of the basement membrane. They do not cross the border into the epidermis, whereas Langerhans cells do so with impunity. They just get all up in the epidermis, no problem. So that can be helpful. And here's an example, okay? You got Langerhans cells clustered up there and you can barely even tell where the, the dermal epidermal junction is. I guess it's like right here. Um, and there's lots of scattered Langerhans cells in the epidermis here. Now, sometimes it can be a little hard in more subtle cases to tell if you just have a really robust Langerhans cell, uh, a Langerhans cell rich example of sponge derm or contact or something, or do you have Langerhans histiocytosis? And I have occasionally in young kids or in times where there's a clinical concern and the microscopic is kind of iffy said, well, there's, a, there's increased Langerhans cells here, but it's not really classic for LCH but it's enough that it's worth keeping an eye on the patient and re-biopsying them if the process continues. Thankfully, I've not had to do that often, but it's certainly something that if you think about it, check the clinical, and if there's any potential it could be, you know, at least have it there on the dermatologist's radar so they can follow the patient and make sure uh, that it does not progress or they can get additional workup. And they have the classic grooved or bean-shaped nuclei, okay, that we learn about. And here's a CD1A immunostain, which is strongly positive. And they're also positive for a molecule called Langerin and then S100 as well. And I'll just mention this here. I, don't have, I have some cases, but I don't have any pictures taken to show you. There's a, a, this very weird rare disease called indeterminate dendritic cell tumor or indeterminate cell histiocytosis, which the simple way to think of it is basically it looks like Langerhans histiocytosis, but it lacks if you do electron microscopy, which most people don't have easy access to, it lacks beer bet granules, which are the classic ultrastructural finding of true Langerhans cells. But otherwise they look and stain like it. The one thing that we do have is this molecule Langerin, which I think is a CD207, I believe. I always have trouble remembering that for some reason. But um, in any case, Langerin seems to go hand in hand with the presence of beer bet granules. So we kind of can use that immunostain as a surrogate marker instead of doing electron microscopy. If Langerin's negative in those cells and it looks like LCH otherwise, then it's probably this indeterminate dendritic cell tumor. And they can, they can present in adults as one or multiple papules on the skin. I've seen a few times where it was like a solitary papule in an old person 
and it microscopic looked just like Langerhans histiocytosis. In those cases, I send out and get the Langerhans stain, and if it's negative, I call it this. Um, there have been some that have had aggressive behavior, but a lot of times they have indolent. It's kind of variable behavior, widely variable, and we don't really know how to predict it, is what the my last reading on it in the WHO uh, said. Okay, mastocytosis. I already showed you, so we'll just kind of go through it. Here's another example of filling the papillary dermis, but not involving the epidermis usually, or very minimal involvement. And again, CD117 or C-Kit is another name for that. We'll stain these strongly, as will mast cell tryptase, um, and you can use some other special stains. Do remember that other things stain with CD117, particularly melanocytes. Okay, so if you see uh, cells in the epidermis that are CD117 positive, they are probably melanocytes. And there's a closer view. You can have EOs in it. And there's a picture. So see, there's those might be a couple melanocytes, or maybe there are a few rogue uh, mast cells that are getting in the epidermis, even though they're not supposed to. Kind of kind of violates the rule I just taught you. But you can see predominantly these are confined to the dermis.